Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks! Hi, I'm Mike Oppenheim, and you're listening to Coffin Talk, Exit Interviews with the Living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. With me this week is Marcy Borger, all the way from Washington, D.C., or technically Virginia. Welcome, Marcy. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, of course. And it's great to have you on. Um, I've known Marcy for more than 20 years. Um, and I was at her wedding and I went to college with her and her husband. So I know them both really well. And I know their beautiful children and all sorts of other things. But you're going to get to know her by her talking about herself and not me. So without any further ado, Marcy, my first questions for you is how old are you? Where did you grow up? And what generation do you identify with? All right. Well, I will be 29 in a, a mere few days. Um, Did you just say 29? Oh, my God. That's how old I want to be. <laughs> I thought you were making a joke. You know? like When you didn't finish the joke, I was like, wait. <laughs> dump that one, right? Um, so I will be 39 in a few days. And I feel like I'm supposed to identify with, what is that, like the millennial age? And I don't know. I, I feel I've always kind of felt like an older soul. So I feel more aligned with like an older generation. So I guess it's like Gen X that's before us. So I, I feel like I align more with that than I do with like the millennial age. And where did I grow up? I grew up outside of Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, but that's about a couple hours north of Pittsburgh. And that is where Marcy and I met. We met at college at the University of Pittsburgh, with also with her husband, as I mentioned. So, correct. Um, so now everyone is is super into you, and they know exactly who you are, and they know that you wish you were twenty nine, but you're mm -hmm. actually turning thirty nine. Um, and by the way, happy early birthday! Is it the nineteenth? Thank you. It is. Well, you are the first person I ever met whose birthday was in February. And believe it or not, this is an actual intelligent segue to my next question, which is you are an old soul. I would totally call you an old soul. And I would say that's 100% why I wanted to have you as a guest on this podcast. But can you explain to our audience what you mean when you use the word old soul? So you don't have to say about yourself, but just what does that term even mean to you? Um, I think just sort of someone that has an appreciation for things that from a long time ago or just sort of maybe not so focused on the like now but like maybe you, an appreciation or an innate understanding of the of the past or things that have happened that makes sense to me but how can you differentiate that from like someone who's just interested in like the civil war or like the roman empire like his history is a subject in school when you say old soul and you talk about the past like what are you more specifically talking about i don't know i not saying in like a deja vu sense of like i've been here before but I don't know. I don't know how to really give you a good answer. That would be a good sound bite of that. Well, I understand that. And I think it, your first answer was good about being interested in the past. I just feel like there's something a little different than just the past. And maybe it's like a different element of time, but I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I'm more interested in how you view the world around you. So maybe I'll try asking a different question. What is a person who has a new soul? What are they like to you? I guess just more optimistic I guess maybe than I am I feel sort of you know that I don't don't have as much faith in humanity sometimes having filtered things through um just an appreciation of of things that have happened before so I want to believe that, that people are are you know good and and want to help but maybe feeling like it's not always that way that's a great answer. Wow. I'm fascinated by that. Um, wow, wow, wow. I have 30 million questions I want to ask. Okay, let's try this one. What, what, what could possibly bring you down about like humanity and humans? Like what, what makes you sad or, or whatever word you want to put in there? Um, I think when I see people not, if, if there's an opportunity to help or to do something nice with the thought of nothing in return other than I, I'm not going to say that if you do something nice for someone, you don't get like an altruistic um, feeling like a helper's high from doing that. But like, like holding the door for someone who's coming behind you, whether they're, you know, some huge, clearly bodybuilding, someone who, who doesn't need you to hold the door or, you know, a frail elderly person. Like it's just 
being nice to, to other people. We're all existing on this plane at the same time, sharing this space and maybe not even having anything in common other than being human. But it's just why why put like evil and negative and even why even put neutral if you have an opportunity to put positive out there? Like I think when I see people just like th- that at a base, people not being kind or you know, just going out of the way to to be negative or rude really makes me feel, um, understand humanity when I see that. And when I see more and more of it, it really just kind of brings me down. I think that that's, you know, out, even beyond like graft or bribery or things that are, you know, so self-serving. I mean, that's, I don't know if it's just the, the news media covering things more and or being an adult. And so I'm more aware of things because you know, those things have always existed. Well, you're definitely you're actually answering the earlier question just in like bits and pieces now, because I feel like you're really getting into this idea of like what an old soul would be and how history works. So did you learn history and then start to feel these sad feelings about people who aren't giving and just trying their best to make the world better or did you sense it and feel it and just know it well i think it's kind of you know some of column a some of column b being raised as you know loosely roman catholic you know you're you're brought up with with certain dogmas and and understanding you know things and my parents were very big into the golden rule so i things that i was expected to carry out and the assumption that other people's families were outside of the Judeo-Christian belief system or everyone sort of being brought up with this, you know, do unto others as you would have done unto you. And so I think it's that part of being a child that, you know, their, their favorite refrain, it's not fair. Like, why am I being held to this, but other people aren't? And so I think part of being taught it through history or religion you know might the example my parents set forth and then you know you even see it in like books or movies or cartoons you know that there's there's always the problem and you know i always associate more with the person that was trying to do the right thing than you know the villain but i mean i think that's a lot of people yeah, but that's, I mean, wow. Uh, I think it would be a really important point of the podcast to actually tell the audience something that I should have said at the very beginning. You're you're very intelligent and you have a really interesting career. And um, I think it definitely is part of why you can be an expert on a lot of these questions you're talking about. So do you mind sharing? You don't have to say where you work if you don't want to, but do you mind sharing exactly what your area of expertise is and all that? I appreciate the compliment, but I'm not, not sure that it's, it's deserved. But I work in um, museums. In, in the area. And so it's a great line of work. I really enjoy it. Uh, I work with a lot of people who are experts in their fields and very willing to, to share. And so if you've got a curious mind, it's there are no stupid questions. I feel like I learn something every day. So it's, it's very energizing to work at a place like that. Um, so would it be fair to say that you have like a pretty above average understanding of like archaeological science and like, you know, history and artifacts well museum studies is more the uh make sure you don't break this in a master's degree so it it gives you (laughs) enough understanding of of how things are are made and constructed but there's certainly other people in the museum that know more about that but my undergraduate is in history and in anthropology so i think you know i get some history from that and just also been enjoying history for my whole life and my family is a big group of readers and you know, historians. So it, it was just sort of the environment that I grew up in. So I, I wouldn't say that I am a, a master of any of these areas, but I, you know, I know, I know enough to where to find more information if I want to find more information. And I just want our audience to know that I've known Marcy, like I said, of 20 years, it, you just can't get her to take a compliment and, and admit she's, I, I love this. This is so funny. You, you have the most genuine humility of most people I've ever met. Um, so I'm going to move forward with the podcast because I just wanted everyone to know that you're like, not just accidentally talking about history a lot. You really are like always immersed in it. With all that said, you were talking about children. So I kind of wanted to ask you, that's why I mentioned at the beginning that you have, you have two children. Um, how old are they? Uh, 10 and will be seven in a few more weeks. And, and so what I want to ask, and you can answer these questions however you want. You can be as like 
uh, specific or unspecific as you want. I'm gonna ask them so that if the kids ever listen, they won't know uh, who which one you're talking about. So that's how I'm gonna take it, but you can do whatever you want. Okay. Are they both old souls? Is one a new soul or are they both new souls? In different ways, I would say they're, they're both old souls um, in that, which we just sort of, you're able to tease out of me what that definition is, that, that they are interested in, in history, both in different ways. And again, I don't know enough because, you know, my sample size is these two children and I'm an only child. So I don't, I can't say all children, but I think I could possibly say old, all children, but understanding that I'm not an expert on it, that, you know, they are interested in the things that that you're interested in too. So if you're reading a book on ancient Egypt, they might be interested in that. So I think, you know, they're interested in it for sure. And, and actually, the other specific question I wanted to ask is the one thing you said about being an old soul that's stuck, and I'm going to keep coming back to it, is you talked about this, like, sadness you feel. And I'm going to go ahead and I, I try to keep myself out of these as much as possible. But I have felt the same thing, and I feel like a kindred understanding of what this means. Like, it's not about being an old soul in a braggadocious or in a pathetic way. It's about there's this feeling of sadness that I get when humanity isn't living up to the level I somehow innately think it should be at. And I'm, I'm using your word specifically because you said innate. Mm-hmm. And like, so I'm trying to be relating to how you phrased it. So does either of your kid before they were like allowed to have the knowledge to feel that sadness, did they ever show that sadness or experience that in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think in, in some ways, you know, things that, but a, a lot of it is, is, you know, when, when they talk about, you know, things in, inner inner family things of like well that's not that's not right that shouldn't be that way don't they know that that hurts that person's feelings and being really small and having that realization like early for that but i don't know they just they seem like they they understand things at a at a higher level i then even i feel like i did when i was younger but i, I think children today have so many more resources to learn and to be educated and they, they pick up things so quickly. Yeah. And I definitely, I, yeah, I mean, I can't prove or disprove that, but I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I, I sense like this newer generation has like a, it's almost sad to me. It's like, they don't, they're not really, I was so naive and innocent in a, in a fun way until a certain point, but I feel like they don't get as much of that. Do you, uh, along a similar line, like your parents raised you Roman Catholic. Did you, are you raising your kids with religion? Uh, they they do attend a, a like a loosely religious school, so they they do have religion as a class. But um, and we are occasional mass goers, and you know they have had up to a certain level of you know initiation within the the Catholic Church. But I think you know once they get past where they're at now, it will be you know my, my older child's in fourth grade and. You know, I, I think that it, it should be a, a, a voluntary thing, but I do continue to try to educate her of what other people do in the world. So today is, is Ash Wednesday and, you know, speaking to them about, you know, different religions. And we were talking about fasting last night, not, not because I wanted them to participate in it, but just as that it's, you know, certain things that other religions participate in and uh, just so that they're aware, because I don't really feel like m- my worldview was so much smaller growing up in very small towns, very homogenous areas of what the rest of the world was doing. And it wasn't really until I was taking you know, a survey undergraduate course in religion that you know, I-, I learned a lot of things. And I think that that's the, w- the world's a bigger place now. And I think that that also goes to their loss of innocence at an earlier age because you have to protect them from more things if they're going to be on the internet or if they're out that you need to to make sure that they're more street smart and savvy about what to do because you know they don't have the experience to draw on to make those decisions and again i mean that was really interesting but do you believe in the roman catholic god like the one that you at a young age were exposed to? You know, like I would say I really, I want to believe in something. I don't, I don't, I, I feel very sad when I, there's a quote by, I can't remember uh, Carl Sagan's partner, but when he passed that because they didn't believe in, in anything else that 
you know, they asked her if she was sad because they they don't believe in being together again. And that she said, no, because we lived every moment together knowing that this was it, that like all we have is now. And I feel like uh, that's not enough for me. And um, I've always sort of felt that wouldn't it be nice if there was something else, if there was something more? So I want to believe that there's something else, whether that is, uh, you know, where you can't, with, with, with matter, you, you can't destroy or create matter. So is it, you know, when, when the, the earthly shell of me ceases to, you know, produce, you know, an electrical beat that runs my brain and heart that, you know, does, where does that go? You know, and whether that's somewhere else or just into the universe, um, I would say I, I don't necessarily believe in heaven and hell. I don't know that I believe in God. I would say I'm, I'm definitely at a point in my life where I'm, I'm questioning things. And what I would say I would like to believe is I'm going to screw this up. So if anyone wants to look it up, they're going to have to probably dig a little bit deeper off to see if I can find it. Uh, there is a letter from the, the Civil War that a, a soldier who is getting ready to go into battle wrote to his wife. And her name is Sarah. I remember that much. And he's saying, you know, pretty much he, he doesn't think that he's going to survive. And that I really wish I would have had some more time with you. This is horrible paraphrasing, but just essentially that I will always be with you. That, you know, if you feel, you know, the breeze on your neck, like when you're hot, that's me trying to cool you down or just that I will always be there in some way. And I think that when I think about death or dying and being apart from people that I love, that that's the thing that that, you know, I'm looking for comfort for myself. I think that that's almost a selfish thing. And in that, you know, when my when my parents pass. But that's going to be really hard for me as an only child and because I have such a close relationship with them. I like that idea of, you know, them still being around. Those are my, uh, uh, is it J.M. Barry who wrote Peter Pan's quote of um, God gave us memories so that we might have roses in December. That like, I will remember the things that they did and they said, but it, they'll still be there. And whether that's like, oh, it's such a coincidence that I heard, you know, Stand By Me, that my dad and I, that was a song that we danced to at, at my wedding. And that was, you know, a movie that we watched together of the same name by, you know, the movie from the book on Stephen King wrote, of the, the short stories. But, you know, is was that a coincidence? Is there a coincidence? Like, I guess it's more of what I'm willing to tell myself to provide comfort to um if there, there isn't anything else, like I can't accept that there's nothing else, I guess. I, lo I love that answer so much. And I think I'm just going to keep throwing out like what I think old soul means based on what you say, because I, I don't know how to explain it either. And so I would say part of being an old soul is, is what you just expressed, which is like knowing that even if it's false, you're gonna attribute strange things as coincidence as more than coincidences. So I have a, I have a, a, f a friend who always says uh, there's no such thing as coincidences unless you believe in coincidences. And I, I just love that <laughs> phrase. It's like every human can relate to that, you know? And so I, what you're getting at is just so universal. And I don't know, I don't know who listens to this podcast, like what ages, but we are at that really tough age where our parents are like still absolutely here, young, vibrant and interesting, but we know we're just not stupid. Like we know how time works. Right. I remember when I was in my twenties and everyone was starting to get married and it seemed like there was, you know, every few weeks there would be a wedding. And I was saying to one of my coworkers, um, oh, I have to go to another wedding. Like this is almost getting unspecial. And, and he dead looked at me and was like, look, you're a 20. You need to enjoy this time because this is the time where you're celebrating life. The next phase of this is people having children. That's life. That's celebrating. And then he said, I am in the phase of my life where I am celebrating people's lives, but they're, they're gone. They're gone from me. Like that's, you know, everyone gets married. Everyone has babies, not everyone, everyone for certainly, you know, but a lot of people do that. And then, but you know, the certainty is everyone will die. We are, like you said, we're at that phase where, you know, our, our parents are getting older. Um, you know, 
people have aneurysms and heart attacks and things that you you know are concealed from you regardless of what state of health you're in that you know you don't wake up one day you don't make it down that flight of stairs and i think that age group coupled with you know where we all find ourselves right now at home or you know only marginally going out or and this is just in case someone's listening to this in the future it's right in the middle of the covid pandemic so right um that like you know it it makes you kind of appreciate those like left turns that you've taken in your life when i took stock of you know six months into quarantine or you know wherever whatever you want to call it covid isolation and that being said this area is not like under we can't leave our houses but you know you're not supposed to go out if you don't need to and we're certainly in mask wearing when you look at you know when you're playing that if you if it is when you die that you get to you know go through all your highlight reel when you're playing that highlight reel what's what's on that and it's for me because i am very much a um type a planner rule book oh it's a school night we can't go out like are you serious? You're 39 years old. And you don't want to go out on a Tuesday? Like, okay, you're, you must be a lot of fun. But like the things that are, you know, the things that I will remember if I get, you know, if I died tomorrow and I get to play that that highlight reel are the things that I did that were outside of my comfort zone. They were the things that like I didn't want to do. Those, those are the things that that are, you know, memorable. Like it's encouraged me to try to be, you know, a, just a, a tiny bit more fun, you know, because I feel. I don't, you know, is it because I'm living every day, like I'm one day closer to dying. And so I, you know, I have this stuff, list of stuff I have to get done. Or am I just that uptight? I mean, it's probably some of both. (laughs) Well, it's interesting because I mean, there's a lot of self-judgment I'm going to ignore because we all have it. But what I do want to focus on is that it seems to me almost like most of the guests I've had have talked about like, why their view on death makes them either keep living or try harder or not worry, or they have a lot of things. But for you, it's like, it makes you want to live more, which is really awesome to me. So it sounds like your, your own philosophy actually motivates you to like try harder to like appreciate it all. Is that correct? Am I hearing that right? Yeah, I think so. But I mean, also it, it, it removes me from the moment sometimes. Because I feel like an observer, you know, when I'm there, you know, and I, I like when I attended your wedding, that that was such a, a great time. And, we, you know, it was the last great event, frankly, before all of this began. And it was, you know, there was so much love and everyone there was just like having a great time that, you know, you find yourself spending 15, 20 minutes away from a group looking at everyone just like, like, I want to remember this. I want to drink this in. Wow. This is so profound. I It's good, but at the same time, like it does remove you from the situation when you, you know, you're trying trying to memorialize something whereas you should just sort of appreciate the moment and live more in it than to be an observer and you know, you're not painting it. But you know, your your memory of it is is going to be, you know, strange anyway because it's it's just your view of it. I'm I'm blown away. I I've, I've you've you've stunned me into silence which anyone who knows me knows is almost impossible i um i really think you get something that i want to get and i'm starting to get and so that's the only way i could phrase it but so so i want to i want to ask like one final question which is how the the basic question i usually ask is like what do you think happens when you die and we kind of talked about that but i i want to know more like how does this shifting change in perspective of yours that like seems to get more and more contemplative as you get older and detached, as you said, like watching things, how does that play into like the way you're No, I'm not asking the question, right? Um, it's cool. Cause I can edit this and make it sound so much more intelligent. Um, is there anything you see coming up in the future that you need to train yourself to like, look at differently? Like, it seems like you're very good at, correcting yourself as you go so that you're living life better so what's like the next project in a spiritual sense that you're working on wow i don't know that i'm gonna have a great answer to that but i feel like instead of like being afraid of dying that that the next phase of of my life because up until now it's been like i don't want to die even though i have no indicators that i would that I would die it would be an accidental or an unknown thing. I've never had anything 
remotely putting me close to to death um that feeling of like i've got more living to do but on the same i guess a different side of the same coin by worrying about dying and spending putting energy into something that doesn't there was no reason to to think that i was going to die that i i lived less because i didn't there's only so much energy in a day so to i think i'm coming more in peace with that whether you know i go up into the sky and you know there that that's you know where i am or i'm reborn or there's just my matter or i come back as a flower whatever that like i'm the, through the living with my friends and my family and the memories that we create that i will live through that and hopefully that it's more of a legacy thing that it's it's not you know that i'm gonna live forever through rebirth or in the sky in heaven and have no pain that it's it's more of i'm hopefully and i say this to my children all the time that if i only do one thing if i only teach you one thing it's it's to to have compassion for other people to be a good person to do the right thing when no one is looking and if that's you know if there's nothing else after death and hopefully they'll have you know their highlight reel will include me that as something that was positive or made them happy or made them feel loved. Wow. That was the most profound, incredible interview. I'm so happy. I, I will give you a chance real quick. If you want to say any last thing. Uh, I don't know. It was interesting to, to, to talk about it. I, I guess I'll have to follow what, you know, celebrities say that I, I won't read the comment section of, of this part of your podcast. You know, I guess that's, that's me. Take it or leave it. You know, very cool. And Marcy, I appreciate it so much. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate your family so much. I know all four of you so well, and I love you all. And thank you so much for helping us put another nail in the coffin. Everyone, I am Mike Oppenheim, and you have listened to another episode of Coffin Talk, Exit Interviews with the Living, and we'll see you soon. I walking alone.